The lacrimal gland is a serous exocrine gland situated in the lacrimal fossa in the suprotemporal part of the orbit. It produces a serous secretion of water, electrolytes, and proteins, which moistens, lubricates, and protects the ocular surface. Here's a stylized image of the gland in its normal anatomical location in the lacrimal fossa. As you can see, the gland is a lobulated pale yellow structure. It curls around the lateral margin of the levator palpebrae superioris aponeurosis and is thus divided into superior orbital and inferior palpable parts. The curling of the gland around the aponeurosis is well shown in the image on the left. In the right image of actual dissected specimens, the palpable part is above the dotted line. Although not obvious here, the thinner 3mm palpable part is about half the size of the thicker 5mm orbital part. Overall, the glands measure 20 by 25 millimeters. They're generally symmetrical between sides, but vary in size between person to person. Asymmetry can be an important clue of pathology, as we can see in these clinical and CT images of a patient with lacrimal gland lymphoma. An understanding of the gland's anatomical relations is essential for the ophthalmologist. For the orbital part, superiorly, we have the periorbiter immediately and the lacrimal fossa behind it. Inferiorly, we have the levator aponeurosis, the globe, and lateroinferiorly, the lateral rectus. Anteriorly, we have the orbital septum and the superior orbital rim. Posterior to the gland lies the orbital fat and lacrimal vein, artery, and nerve. The palpable part is related to the levator aponeurosis superiorly. Inferiorly lies the superior fornix of the conjunctiva and the globe. Anteriorly lie the superior tarsal plate and levator aponeurosis. Posteriorly lie the globe and orbital fat. Approximately 12 ducts from the lacrimal gland drain into the superior conjunctival fornix. They start in the orbital part and course through the palpable part before opening into the fornix. As all the ducts ultimately pass through the palpable part, surgery or injury to it may impair or destroy drainage of the whole gland. Scarring of the conjunctiva, such as by chemical burns, iatrogenic injury, or diseases affecting the ocular surface, may also obstruct secretion outflow. Dry eye may not always result, however, as the accessory lacrimal glands of Krauss and Wolfring, located in the conjunctiva of the superior fornix and superior tarsal border respectively, may be sufficient to keep the ocular surface moist. The gland's arterial blood supply is through the lacrimal artery, a branch of the ophthalmic artery arising near the orbital apex. From its origin, it follows the superior margin of the lateral rectus to reach the lacrimal gland. Approximately three millimeters before entering the gland, the artery splits into medial and lateral branches. Venous drainage is through the lacrimal vein, which exits the gland posteriorly and follows a similar course to the lacrimal artery to drain into the superior ophthalmic vein. Lymphatic drainage of the gland joins that of the conjunctiva and passes to the superficial parotid nodes. In terms of nerve supply, sensory fibres to the lacrimal gland travel in the lacrimal nerve, a branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Parasympathetic supply, which triggers lacrimation, originates in the lacrimal nucleus in the pons. From there, preganglionic fibres travel with the nervous intermedius to the greater petrosal nerve, and then through the vidian nerve to the pterygopalatine ganglion. There they synapse, and the postganglionic fibres join the maxillary nerve, passing through its zygomatic branch, and then the zygomatico-temporal nerve to reach the lacrimal nerve. Sympathetic fibres, which suppress lacrimation, travel through the internal carotid artery plexus to merge with the deep petrosal nerve. The fibres then follow the vidian nerve to the pterygopalatine ganglion, where from they follow a similar pathway to the parasympathetic fibres. Embryologically, the lacrimal gland develops from invaginations in the ectoderm of the suprolateral angles of the conjunctival sacs at around six to seven weeks gestation. They are divided by the levator aponeurosis into the orbital and palpable lobes at around 10 weeks and continue to mature until about six weeks after birth. As seen in the histological slide on the right, the lacrimal gland has a lobulated tubo asinar structure with lobules separated by loose connective tissue. The asini consist of exocrine columnar cells lining a central lumen with surrounding myoepithelial basal cells that help expel secretory products into intralobular ducts. The intralobular ducts, which are lined with cuboidal cells and myoepithelial cells, progressively channel into interlobular ducts before finally joining the main ducts that empty into the superior conjunctival fornix. It is important to note that the connective tissue contains plasma cells, which produces IgA, a key factor in the ocular immune system. I hope you found this an interesting introduction into the anatomy of the lacrimal gland. Thank you.